Good morning. It's a privilege to preach again to you as pastor is away. I want to return this morning to the teaching about holiness set forth in the letter of 1 John, which we looked at together two weeks ago. I want to, this morning, explore further application of this teaching with you, and I want to warn you about some errors regarding holiness that are so frequently circulating today. Therefore, this message is going to be a little different than what we normally do at this church. This is going to be a little bit more topical than expositional, but still based off of the passage that we looked at together. Let's entreat the Lord together in prayer. Father, you are very great. You are holy, and you dwell in inapproachable light, and yet you've made a way for us to approach you. You've brought us into your holy, dazzling presence through Jesus Christ. And then you've made us holy. God, it distresses me that there are some ideas and some teachings that suggest or encourage Christians to not pursue holiness. So God, I pray that through the message today that you would work in the hearts of your people to show them what their obligation is, but also show them that you have given them the empowerment to do it. And that it is not a burdensome task, it is a joyful task. Open my mouth to be able to speak these things clearly. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Be holy in 2016. Among many other resolutions that you have made this year, I hope that this one is chief among them. To be holy in 2016. You must not make this resolution as others make resolutions, as a high-minded ideal that when faced with hard reality or difficulty, is quickly set aside. No, this is one resolution you must keep at all costs. No matter the pain, no matter what must be sacrificed. Be holy in 2016. Why? Why be so serious about holiness? Well, because we've seen together from the Word of God that unless our lives are characterized by holy behavior, we are not true believers of Christ. We are not saved. Let's look back at the letter of 1 John chapter 1. Please open your Bibles there with me. I want to briefly review the argument of the Apostle John that we looked at together last time before I discuss anything new. So 1 John chapter 1. Remember the setting of this text? The last living apostle, John, writes to the churches in Asia Minor to counter false teaching from the Gnostics. These Gnostics were teaching that what one did in the body had nothing to do with salvation. It does not matter if you continue to sin, since it is your knowledge and love of God in your spirit that saves you. John, the zealous apostle of love, emphatically sets the record straight on what the true gospel is. Let's read again 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, down to chapter 2, verse 11, starting in verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, We make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, 
and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. By this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Recall with me that John presents three main points in this text related to the truth that God is light. Point one, believers walk in light because their God is light. Because God is a God of dazzling holiness, it is necessary that his people also become holy in their behavior. God's nature demands it. He cannot fellowship with darkness, nor accept a people of darkness to represent him. Therefore, it is totally inconsistent for someone to know the God of light while continuing to allow deeds of darkness in his life. But such holiness is not work salvation. This holiness is the result of salvation, as John makes clear in his second point. Point two, believers have been cleansed by and continually seek cleansing in God's light. No one is holy without being cleansed by Christ's sacrifice. All people must come to God confessing and repenting of their sins. All people must ask for God's, God's pardon on the basis of Jesus' sacrifice alone, proclaiming, I have no righteousness on my own, but I trust in the perfect life and death of your Son on my behalf to pay for my sin. God honors this request. He's faithful to accomplish a complete cleansing and full pardon. As the believer proceeds onward in his life, he continues to seek cleansing any time that he sins, repenting of the sin and putting the behavior to death, but all the while trusting that his advocate, Jesus Christ, will plead Jesus' righteousness on the believer's behalf. The believer has no need to fear loss of salvation or the wrath of God for these occasional sins. He trusts that he is covered once and for all by Jesus' cleansing blood. However, no believer may use Christ's work as a license to tolerate habits of sin. Believers do sin now and then, but it is no longer their pattern. Their lives used to be characterized by sinful habits and sinful patterns, but no more. Because they have been transformed by the light of God, believers are now marked by righteous behavior and continual effort to destroy sin wherever it appears in their lives. Any Christian who uses Christ's cleansing as an excuse to not go all out and putting sin to death shows, as John says, that he is not really a Christian at all. He doesn't know God. Christ's followers love and obey Christ. And they've been empowered by Christ to do so. And that's John's third point. Point three, believers are empowered to keep God's law of love by the new light of Christ. God's law, summarized in the command to love other people, never goes away for the Christian. Before salvation, God's great old commandment 
shows a person that he does not meet God's standard and can never. He will be punished unless cleansed by Jesus Christ. But after salvation, God's old command becomes new. The believer has a new standard, Christ's love, a new example, Christ's sacrifice, and a new power, the transforming light of Jesus. Believers are regenerated by the Holy Spirit to actually obey God's law. They want to do this, and they are able to do this through God's supernatural working within them. Therefore, all Christians become characterized by righteous behavior, especially sincere and consistent love for others. Those Christians who exhibit a pattern of lovelessness or indifference to others, especially their own brethren, show that they are still in darkness. They are stumbling away from God and stumbling toward eternal damnation. So yes, the Apostle John makes very clear that holiness is extremely important for a believer. It is the expected outworking of God's salvation gift of faith in a person's life. So, dear brethren, consider specifically with me. Are there areas of your life that are still marked by sinful habits? Are there areas where you regularly commit sin, even though it is not necessarily every moment or even every day? You sin, you feel bad, you repent, but the sin keeps regularly appearing in your life. Some examples for illustration to get us thinking through this. Do you have a habit of sexual sin? Indulging in lustful acts or imaginations? Indulging in pornography, masturbation, prostitution, or adultery? Paul says not even a hint of immorality is to be in the lives of believers. Do you have a habit of sinful anger? Anger that does not accomplish the righteousness of God, but is zealous for what you believe you are due. Do you, as a pattern, get angry when people sin against you? Or when your kids don't do what you want? Or when a situation doesn't work out the way you thought it should? Do you hold grudges and habitually not forgive others? Do you live in a pattern of anxiety? Anytime a stressful situation appears in your life, you berate yourself for not making wiser choices. You think endlessly about the problem and its potential negative outcomes, and you do not trust God's power to provide what you need if you are simply obedient. Are there sin habits that you have been maintaining in your life like these? Are there areas in your life where you regularly fail to do righteousness? It's not just the sins that you commit, but it's the righteousness that you don't do. Again, let me give you some illustrations just to get us thinking. Even though you are sexually faithful or hardworking at your job, do you consistently fail to give quality care and attention to your family, to your spouse? to your children? Do you regularly refuse to share the gospel with others? Always saying to yourself, no, not this time. They won't accept my witness. This will be too awkward. I'm not ready. Do you realize that making disciples is one of the primary commands of Jesus? Do you proceed through life without giving consistent attention to that which God says you must? To prayer? To the scriptures? To the fellowship of believers? To serving Christ's body? Do you always give the same excuses? I'm too tired. 
I don't need it. They'll be fine without me. I've got too many other things going on. Do you not know that Christ commands believers to seek God's word like milk? To pray without ceasing? To forsake not the fellowship of the body? And to use the gifts he's given you for everyone's edification? Are there righteous deeds that you have regularly been failing to do like these? Now, perhaps you are ignorant about these things. You didn't know what God commands you, what God commands you, or you, you didn't know that you've been empowered and obligated to do God's commands. Well, if so, then now is the time to repent, to change your thinking, and to change your life. Perhaps you want to obey, but you're not sure how to do it. You're not sure how to apply the principles that God gives in his word. Well, if so, then get help from mature believers. Get help from your elders. Subject yourself to continual discipleship and to the teaching of God's word. Be present during Sunday school and during the worship service. Listen to messages outside of Sunday. Those are for your equipping. God provided that for you so you would know how to apply his word. Know what the will of the Lord is and how to do it. To further aid you, to further aid us in our necessary pursuit of holiness, I want to take the rest of the time today to talk about certain truths of the Bible that are frequently abused today in a way that harms our pursuit of holiness. Just as in the apostles of the Apostle John's time, even Paul's time, all the apostles, bad teaching has become widespread. Error has become attached to truth. And when we fall into that error, we find ourselves deceived and unable to live lives of holiness. So I'm calling these the four frequently abused truths. The four frequently abused truths. And here they are. One, Christians still sin. Two, God is sovereign. Three, God's grace motivates our holiness. And four, God provides sufficient means for our holiness. While all of these are true and biblical, they become twisted today away from their original meaning and implications in such a way as to discourage holiness and encourage sin. Let's see how, as we look at each of these truths in turn, we're going to look at what the truth of the scripture actually is and how it's wrongfully being interpreted frequently today. So abuse truth number one, Christians still sin. What is this truth abused to mean? It's abused to mean sin habits are normal for Christians. Sin habits are normal for Christians. Despite the clear teaching from 1 John and many other places in the Bible, many speak or act as if continual failure to mortify sin is normal for believers. In fact, if you assert the Bible's real standard of holiness, you are painted as out of touch, unloving, judgmental, and legalistic. You sometimes hear people say things along these lines, like, I'm only human. Though I'm a Christian, I sin just like everyone else. Or, it's not about whether you overcome the sin or not, it's about whether you struggle. Or, I don't want to appear holier than thou. I'm just the same as you, or any sinner. Strangely, bizarrely, sinfulness has become like a badge of honor, even among Christian teachers. In an effort to seem more real and relatable to their audiences, and to supposedly give God more glory, they love to talk about how sinful they are. You know, I am really messed up. We all are, but God's grace is greater than our sin. Even on the way to church today, I sinned. I'm just a wretched sinner. 
We are just like Israel. We are so faithless. But when we are faithless, he is faithful. Now, granted, it is right for a Christian to confess that he is not perfect. Paul does the very same thing in Philippians. If you're in home groups, you've studied this recently. Philippians 3.12, Paul says, Not that I have already obtained it, or have already become perfect, but I press on, so that I may lay hold of that for which I was also laid hold of by Christ Jesus. So Paul admits he's not perfect. But Paul could also say, 2 Timothy 1.3, I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience, the way my forefathers did. And 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul says, Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Paul was not perfect, but he had a standard of righteousness. And any preacher ought to be able to say the same things. This strange glorying and sinfulness we see today extends to Christian music, even some of our beloved hymns. Songs declaring how we are so prone to wander, how we are just so wretched, how loveless we frequently are toward Christ. Now, before you think I'm calling for us to trash all these songs, these lyrics, or lyrics like these, are true and worshipful if understood in the right way. Yes, before salvation, we are completely helpless and wretched. But Christ has given us life and made us holy. And yes, after salvation, we do still have a sinful nature that desires to wander from Christ. But Christ gives us victory over the flesh. And yes, even our occasional failures to us are so grievous that we rightly believe them to be all too frequent. but we should never allow our music to give us the impression that habits of sin are normal or somehow God-glorifying for Christians. We must not glory in sin. Or we do exactly what Paul forbids. Romans 6, 1-2. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Grace will be magnified? May it never be! How shall we who died to sin still live in it? But someone will say, doesn't Paul himself confess that he doesn't do what he wants to do and he does do what he doesn't want to do? Isn't that admission, an admission of frequent failure to mortify sin? We don't have time to fully look at that today, but yes, in Romans 7, Paul does make statements to that effect. But if you look just a little bit earlier in the chapter, you'll see why. Paul is not talking about his present life as a Christian, but he's talking about God's, how God's law by itself is powerless to produce holiness in someone's life. Our sinful nature, Paul says, I'm paraphrasing him just for the sake of time, our sinful nature uses God's law to take us captive. And we become totally helpless and enslaved to our sin. Even though we know God's law is good and right, we say all those standards are good, yes, I should be like that, we do not and we cannot keep it. Our sin nature is inflamed by hearing the command of God and it takes us over. But all of that changes in Christ. Which is why Paul says at the end of that chapter, Romans 7, verses 24 to 25, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus sets us free from the law and gives us life by his spirit. And because we are cleansed by faith in Christ, we now actually can be obedient to God's commands and must be. Romans 7, 6, before Paul had even given those examples about how helpless we are under the law, Paul says, Romans 7, 6, But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit 
and not in oldness of the letter. That's what Paul was talking about. And this is why Paul is able to say in the very next chapter of Romans, Romans 8, verses 12 to 14. So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. That is the exact same thing that we learn from the Apostle John, isn't it? The old commandment has become new for you because you now have Christ's Spirit. Therefore, you are obligated to be holy and to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Those that glory in sin or treat sin habits as normal for Christians are plain not being faithful to the scriptures. True belief and repentance in Christ always produces visible fruit. Do you want to know whether your repentance is real? Whether your first repentance to believe in Christ or any subsequent repentance? Look for fruit. Look for change. Look for a changed habit of life. Because anything else you look for or try to use as evidence can be deceptive. We often associate sorrow and guilt with repentance, and those things do accompany repentance often, but they themselves are not repentance. You can have those things without being truly repentant. Esau and Judas both expressed sorrow and guilt, but they were not truly repentant. They received nothing from God. Even an expressed commitment to change, if you say, I'm now going to change, or if you say to yourself, mm, you know, I'm no longer going to be this way, even an expressed commitment to change or a momentary sensation of sin is not in itself repentance. Consider Pharaoh. Ten times Pharaoh went back on his promise to release Israel. Even after he confessed his sin, he said, I'm the sinful one, God is the righteous one. That sounded like repentance. But it wasn't, because he never changed his pattern. Or consider King Saul. Saul went after David various times, wanted to kill David. And then David confronted him and had mercy on him several times. And Saul confessed David to be more righteous. He called off the pursuit of David. And then a short time later, he resumed. He resumed the hunt. Saul had never put to death the idol in his heart. He was still lusting after the kingdom. The only genuine proof of repentance, dear brothers and sisters, is a changed pattern of life. That is the only proof. And believers must display such proof. John the Baptist says, Matthew 3, verses 8 to 10, Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The ax is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Jesus Himself also says, Matthew 7, verses 17 to 21, So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them, that is people, by their fruits. And then James says, James 2.17, Even so faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Without fruit, there is no proof of repentance, but instead, a fearful expectation of judgment. Let us not deceive ourselves, or try to deceive others about our state. <clears throat> 
Ananias and Sapphira tried to do this. You remember? At the beginning of the church age, at the church's establishment in the book of Acts, they lied to the Holy Spirit. They lied about their generosity for God's sake. And God supernaturally struck them down. God wanted to make clear at the beginning of the church's life that his gathering of believers is to be marked by holiness, not sin, and not hypocrisy. One last note before we move on to any of the other truths, but how is God faithful when we are faithless? That verse is quoted a lot, but let's look at the context of that statement. Actually, turn over there in your Bible. I want you to see this yourself. 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. So this is towards the latter part of the New Testament. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. How is God faithful when we are faithless? Look at verse 11. It is a trustworthy statement. For if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Context gives us a little better understanding of that statement, doesn't it? How was God faithful? Well, if we turn to Christ, believe, and obey, we receive salvation and reward. But if we deny Christ and disobey, God denies us and brings judgment on us. He doesn't say, oh, you denied me. Well, I'm going to keep being faithful to you. No, he's faithful to himself. God cannot deny himself. He's too glorious. He's too holy to let habitual unbelief and unrighteousness to go unpunished. God is faithful to himself. So yes, Christians still sin, but this does not mean habits of sin are normal or glorious in the Christian life. Christians are to be marked by holiness. So we see the first abused truth. But it's not just truth about the Christian condition that is twisted to harm sanctification. People also twist truths about God. So this brings us to abused truth number two. God is sovereign. This truth is frequently abused to mean Christians must wait passively for God to sanctify them. Christians must wait passively for God to sanctify them. This is sometimes the thinking when people say, you can't just expect people to change right away. Sanctification is a process. I can't do something unless God does it first. I don't want to do something on my own strength. They often search for these verses to support their erroneous interpretation. Philippians 1.6 Paul says, I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. They say, see, God begins the work and he has to do the work. Or 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 25, they highlight the phrase, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. They say, it's God who grants people repentance. You can't actually repent of a sin until God allows you and empowers you to do so. You're helpless until then. Or John 15, 5. They take the words of Jesus. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We have no power to do anything apart from whatever Christ does. We have to wait on Christ, they say. Now it is true. God is sovereign. God is sovereign over everything. He's sovereign over what happens in your life. He's sovereign over salvation. And he's sovereign over sanctification. It's true that if you make any progress in holiness, it is because of God. It is because he has given a gift of kindness to you. He has sanctified you. He has done all the work. He deserves the thanks and all the glory. However, it is not true that God's sovereignty means that we should be passive or just wait on God. Rather, 
because we know that God is working in us to make us holy, we are to strive with as much effort as possible. Philippians 2, 12 to 13 says this so concisely for us. You know the verses. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Yes, God is doing it all. Therefore, you give maximum effort. It's like what we've been seeing in Sunday school with Joshua. God promised to give the land, the whole promised land to Israel. But Israel wasn't supposed to just sit back and wait for it to happen. They were to obey God's commands and go forth courageously into battle. They could be courageous because they knew God was fighting for them. It's the same in our sanctification. God does wholly provide our sanctification. But the means he uses include our own striving and our own suffering for Christ's sake. Furthermore, God's means of sanctification include the scriptures and the church. One cannot say, I'm sorry, I can't put this sin habit to death until God shows me I need to and he shows me how. Don't you see that God is already doing that? When he confronts you with his word or when he confronts you with concerned brethren, God is directly providing for your sanctification. Why are you resisting the work of God? Why do you, like Saul of Tarsus, kick against the goads? And why would you even want to wait around? This is like those who say, well, if I'm elect, God has to come get me. Obedience, being with God, is the place of blessing. Disobedience is the place of cursing and painful discipline. Why would you want to drag your feet? Don't you desire to receive the best? Or is the reality that you believe your sin is better than God? That's why you drag your feet. God does receive all the glory for the sanctification process of our lives, but we have a responsibility. Just as we are accountable to believe in Christ, we are accountable for living Christ in our lives, going all out to know and to do God's will. We sang it in one of the songs, but Paul says that the Christian life is like running a marathon race. And not just to finish it, but to run as if you were going to win it, or you were trying to win it. That means it takes effort, it takes discipline, it takes suffering. But Christ is sufficient motivation to do this. I'll read you some relevant verses. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 23 to 27. Paul says, I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. You can't simply wait until running the race seems agreeable to you, seems easy to you. It never will. It's a race. It will always be hard but you can do it, and you must do it, because God will be the one to keep your legs from giving out. If you go all out to win the race of holiness and salvation, he will cause you to win. But someone will say, sanctification is a process. God doesn't sanctify all parts of your life at the same time, right? Right? 
Well, let's not misunderstand what is meant by process. Sanctification is indeed a process, but not a process in which we maintain sinful habits and slowly decrease the frequency of those habits over time. Oh, I only had a three outbursts of rage this week instead of five. That's progress. That can't be right. Have these sin habits to continue in our life because that would contradict the teaching of Paul and John. Sin is still characterizing us. No, let's not forget that salvation itself, coming to believe in God for the first time, is a total crucifying of the old way. Every sin was put to death in Christ when you believed. Every part of your life was immediately given over to sanctification. And each of those parts are to remain sanctified if you are a true follower of Christ. What is gradual about sanctification is that we learn how to be sanctified in new areas. Any new believer can relate to you the experience of reading or hearing the teaching of the Bible and saying, I didn't realize that this thing that I've been doing is sin. I've got to stop doing it now. Or, I didn't know that I needed to be doing this act of righteousness. I'm going to start doing that. Our sanctification is gradual gradual because it takes time to learn and understand what God really calls for us to do. We don't know that all at once. It's also the experience of believers that even when they have established patterns of righteousness, when they have put to death sins by faith, God stretches their faith with a new situation or a more difficult challenge. It was one thing for Abraham to trust God by traveling to Canaan, but it was another thing to trust God by offering up Isaac, his son. It was one thing for Job to trust God when everything was going well. But it was another thing to trust God when his life became a ruin. These men were being sanctified in areas in which they already were obedient. But God was just taking that obedience to new heights by putting them in a new, more difficult situation. There are other ways we can describe the gradualness of sanctification. But the idea of process certainly does not mean that we are somehow unable to put to death certain sin habits until we somehow level up as Christians. It's striking, actually, speaking of 1 John. In the verses after the ones that we looked at, the Apostle John pauses to say things like, I'm writing to you spiritual fathers. I'm writing to you young men. I'm writing to you children. But his message is the same to each group. Be holy in your behavior. It wasn't just for the fathers. It wasn't just for the young men. It was for everyone. They all could do it. They all were responsible to do it. And in every area of their lives. So God's sovereignty is important for us to understand in sanctification, but not in a way that leads us to be passive needs to be understood in a way that leads us to be active in obedience. We pray to God and we obey God because we know God has power. And he uses that power in us and on our behalf. So we see the second abused truth. But is there yet some secret way to make sanctification easy or effortless or automatic? Some seem to think there is. And this brings us to abuse truth number three. The truth is, God's grace motivates our holiness. But this truth is abused to mean, if I just meditate on X, X being some spiritual concept, then my sanctification should happen automatically. If I just meditate on X, then my sanctification should happen automatically. You can hear this idea in various versions of the hyper-grace movement, which Greg described some months ago in his sermon on sanctification. People say things like, if you just meditate on your identity in Christ, or if you just meditate on the love Christ has for you, or if you just meditate on the acceptance that you have from God, or if you just meditate on the greatness of God, or if you just meditate on the joy of Christ, you'll become sanctified. They also say things like, you need to develop your affections for Christ and for the things of God 
before you can be obedient. Or if you try to be obedient for any other reason than total love and affection for Jesus, then you're actually being idolatrous and hypocritical. You dishonor God, unless you are totally and 100% motivated by love. Those who espouse these ideas often go to verses like Romans 2, 4. Again, they highlight a certain section. Not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. They say, no other motivation except positive appreciation of God's love are acceptable for repentance and obedience. Or John 14, 15, where Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. They say, see, you have to love Jesus first before you can rightly obey him. Or 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. They say again, love is the only acceptable motivation for obedience. Now this error is particularly painful for me because I found myself going along with it for a time. I thought it was correct. Now it is true. We ought to meditate things on things like the kindness of God and our identity in Christ. And it's true. We are to exhibit genuine affection for God and his commands. And it's true that Christ is our motivation for all holiness. God's grace is our motivation for sanctification. However, overemphasizing these concepts leads to short-circuited sanctifications because Christians become obsessed with their feelings. They pay too much attention to their feelings. And they fall into a tragic cycle, which often looks like this. Unless they feel total affection for God, they feel that they are not able to be obedient and any effort towards obedience will not be accepted by God. After all, if it's not done out of 100% love, it's hypocrisy and God hates that. They therefore constantly seek out activities that ought to increase their affection for Christ. They study zealously the word of God. They participate often in worship and in fellowship with other Christians. They expect that maintaining a spiritual high from these activities will somehow make them strong against temptation. But when temptation comes, sometimes their feelings, under influence of the flesh, begin to wane for Christ. They begin to want to go after their sin. And they, they now notice that they don't have total affection for Christ, and they despair of being able to overcome I, don't, I no longer love Christ 100%. My obedience won't be acceptable to him. Therefore, why even try? And they give in to their sin. And after a time of grief, they resolved to do better next time by better cultivating their affections for Christ so that they won't fall. And they suppose that the new mercy that they felt from Christ as Christ takes them back like the prodigal son despite their sin they suppose that this will be an even better bulwark against falling again. They should now love Christ even more because of how gracious he was to their sin. But the cycle repeats. Their feelings wane. They give in to their sin. And they resolve to cultivate better affections next time. And if you come alongside such a one and say, you need to put to death this sin. Sinful habits are not to remain in a believer's life. The one answers, you are being unloving to me by making me feel grieved and ashamed about my failures. Those feelings will only lead me away from Christ. Only love of God's kindness will bring me back to him. You need to encourage me by showing me Christ's love. That's the only acceptable motivation. And this interpretation of Christ's motivating, motivating grace, true sanctification never takes place because the adherents fail to realize a number of important things. First, the joy of Christ is the result of obedience and not the prerequisite. The joy of Christ is the result of obedience and not the prerequisite. No matter how much you meditate on Christ, if you do not obey him, then you do not have the right to enjoy him. Jesus says in John 15:10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. 
Only those who obey Christ are able to abide in his love. They alone can enjoy Christ's love. They can stay there. As long as one sees enjoying Christ or anything that belongs to him as a precondition to obedience instead of a promised result, that one will not consistently obey Christ because he already has his prize without obedience. He already has the joy of Christ. So where's the real motivation to persevere? In fact, when you sin, that just makes you enjoy Christ more. He already has his prize, so he's not going to put to death his sin. And they need to realize that Christ, the joy of Christ is the result, not the prerequisite of obedience. They also need to realize that feelings are not an, a reliable indicator of what you love, but your actions are. Your feelings are not a reliable indicator of what you love, but your actions are. Those who participate in this error forget that the flesh is still with believers. And many times, when presented with the choice to obey or disobey, our fleshly part will, unsurprisingly, not feel like being obedient. Now, this does not mean that we have to go back and reinstruct the flesh or inflame our emotions for Christ. The flesh is never going to want to do right. You can never fully get rid of the flesh. Obedience is not eliminating the flesh. It's choosing not to listen to the flesh, to not submit to its desires, and instead, by faith, choosing to listen to the Holy Spirit, to listen to the Word of God, and consequently obeying. It's like the man whose wife asks him to wash the dishes. Sometimes the man may say, I am so overflowing with affection for my wife, this doesn't seem like a chore to me at all. But if you are a frequent dishwasher, you know that's not always the way it feels. Sometimes when the man hears the wife's request, he thinks, oh man, I really don't want to do the dishes. There are a lot of them that look pretty gross. Mm. But thinking this thought, having this thought, does not mean that the man obviously doesn't love his wife. Feeling some desire not to do her will is not proof of his state. What is the proof of his love? If he decides to serve her in spite of his feelings or not. It is what he does that shows whether he values his wife or not. His actions not his flesh-influenced feelings, are the better indicator of what he believes. You can see what he values based on what he does. Now, yes, a man may do the dishes resentfully or fearfully, just as a man may obey Christ while feeling resentment or fear. And that obviously is not godly. That is sin coming out in his actions. But it is going too far to say that feeling the influence of the flesh at all is a sign that, well, you don't love Christ totally. That's just not true. The old man remains with us, and it always will. Love is proven through obedience over fleshly feelings, not listening to the old man. So we need to realize that feelings are not a reliable indicator of our love for Christ, but our actions are. And also, we and those in this era need to realize, in order to help ourselves and others love Christ, it is right for us to make use of so-called bad emotions. In order for us to help others and help ourselves love Christ, it is right for us to make use of so-called bad emotions. What am I talking about? Things like fear, sorrow, and shame. Those who would like to say positive appreciation of the kindness of God is to be our only motivation for holiness, forget the context of that statement. Romans 2, 3 to 4. You can turn there if you wish. You can see it yourself. Romans 2, 3 to 4. What does Paul mean when he says, when he mentions the kindness of God brings us to repentance? Look at verse 3. Romans 2, verse 3. But do you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, 
that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Paul was not looking to comfort his audience when he referred to the riches of God's kindness, but he instead wanted them to feel what? Guilt, shame, even fear. Look at how lightly you are treating God's patience towards you. Are you not ashamed? Are you not afraid? Fearful a judgment awaits you if you do not repent of this great ingratitude. Or hear this from Paul, 1 Corinthians 6, 4. After mentioning to the Corinthians that, the, that there were Christians in their congregation suing one another, taking one another to court, Paul says, I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not among you one wise man who will be able to decide between his brethren? Paul wanted them to feel ashamed that they had allowed such blatant sin in their midst. Why? So that they would repent so that they would end this sinful pattern and be free from their shame. Or hear this from Paul, 2 Corinthians verse, or chapter 7, verses 8 to 10. 2 Corinthians 7, verses 8 to 10. Paul says, For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that the letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Paul rebuked the church of Corinth and made them feel sorrowful. But that was a good thing. It was a sorrow unto repentance. That's the whole point. Now, don't misunderstand me. Believers walking in light have no need to fear God's judgment or feel any longer shame or guilt. What John said in 1 John 4 is still true. There is no fear in love. When you're walking in the Lord, when you walk in his love, when you walk in his light, you have no need to fear or be ashamed. You have the cleansing and assurance of Christ. But if you walk in darkness, then you need to see how you ought to be sorrowful, ashamed, and fearful as long as you don't repent. Only obedience to Christ can free you from those painful emotions. But that's the point. You ought to run to Christ. But someone will say, won't using shame or fear just turn people off from repentance? Well, truly, some do use these godly prods as excuses to flee from God. Adam and Eve hid from God because of their shame, though they should have run to God for cleansing. Judas hanged himself because of his guilt and sorrow rather than repent. But in these situations, it was the reaction to God's prod that was wrong, not the prod itself. Indeed, men always look for excuses to run away from God. God's kindness, they use that as an excuse not to come to him. God's chastening, they use that as an excuse not to come to him. The Bible does instruct us to speak gently and to reason patiently with others, but it is to be done with firmness. We must not compromise the true gospel of God. Salvation is by faith, but its result is is the total setting aside of sinful habits, wherever they appear and wherever we notice them. If we are ex afraid to expose the sin of the unrepentant and make them feel ashamed, sorrowful, or, sin or fearful, how can we ever bring them to the holiness that is necessary in the life of a saved believer? So no, there is no shortcut to sanctification. Meditation on Christ, his love, or the joy of God, while all helpful and necessary, they will never completely rid us of the flesh's desires. But true love for Christ is not displayed in how we feel, but in what we do. And what do we do? We choose to obey the word of God over the false word of the flesh. <laughs>
God's grace does motivate our holiness. But we will always have to apply effort and deny the flesh. So we see the third abused truth. God's grace does motivate our holiness, but that doesn't mean it can ever become automatic by just meditating on spiritual truth. This last abused truth, we don't have time this morning to fully explore, but I'll just mention it briefly. Abuse truth number four, God provides sufficient means for our holiness. Now, God does provide sufficient means for our holiness, but this truth is misinterpreted in two contrasting ways. Sometimes people take this to mean, I must and can conquer my sin alone. I must and can conquer my sin alone. Over-relying on the Holy Spirit and their personal willpower, a believer goes after sanctification without using all of the resources God has provided. He does not consistently pray, does not consistently read the scriptures, does not subject himself to preaching, and does not seek the counsel and fellowship of others. This is not the method of sanctification that God meant. This is a recipe for failure. Going all out against sin means you make use of all the resources you have in Christ and in the church. Just you and the Holy Spirit are not enough. But there's another way that people interpret that this truth that God, God has provided sufficient means for our holiness. They say, well, others then must conquer my sin. Others are responsible to conquer my sin. A believer blames his own sinful failures on others, supposing that he didn't receive the he didn't receive enough from them, enough love, enough support, or enough instruction to attain victory. Or maybe other people tempted him to go astray. No, it's their fault. I can't win because of them. This is especially true when a person supposes his sin problem is so deep or unique that it requires an inordinate amount of attention from others to be defeated, or else it's not his fault. While the Bible clearly shows us that we are to make use of discipleship and fellowship as part of our sanctification, each person must ultimately bear his own load. We cannot blame others for our failures. We are responsible for our own sin. But there's a gracious promise. If we truly seek mortification, if we seek help, the Lord will provide what we need. He will give us enough. I don't have time to consider the full reference, but you know that no temptation has overtaken a man except what he's able to bear. And God causes him or provides him with the route of escape. We can never blame God or others for not giving us enough. He does. So in closing, the scriptures make it clear or these truths from the scripture that are abused today are true. As they were originally meant, Christians do still sin. God is sovereign, even over sanctification. God's grace does motivate our sanctification. And God does always provide sufficient means for our holiness. But we must not misinterpret these ideas or not, not misapply these truths. This does not mean that sin habits are normal for Christians or somehow God-glorifying. This does not mean that we are to wait passively for God to sanctify us. This does not mean that simply meditating on God's truth will make sanctification effortless. This does not mean that we can conquer sins alone or that we can blame others if they do not conquer our sins for us. These ideas are twisting of scriptural truth and they harm sanctification. That's not God's way. That's not what God has actually declared. God's people walk in light because their God is light. So this morning I ask you, do you need to change the way you've been thinking about sanctification? Is the reason that you have not put to death certain sins, even though you've tried and you've tried, is because you're thinking about it the wrong way. You've taken hold of an error of uh, one of the misapplications of scriptural truth. If so, I urge you this morning, repent. Change your thinking and conform it to the word of God. Let's close in prayer.
Father, we do recognize that you are sovereign. And unless you provide for sanctification, in one sense, it won't happen. Every, every way that you, that you cause us to conquer sin is a gracious gift. And we thank you for the different means that you've provided, that you provided your church, that you provided the scriptures, that you provided preaching, that you provided discipleship and fellowship as all part of causing us to walk in light. Yet, Lord, your scripture make it clear that we have a responsibility. We are to run with great effort so that we can win this race. Lord, we know that this, this does not bring us salvation. And this does not earn us favor with you in a salvific sense. But it is the result. We know it's the result. You make it so clear in your scriptures again and again and again and again. So Father, I pray that you'd move each person here and anyone listening to go all out in putting to death sin because you are worth it. You are worth saying no to the flesh. You are that great. Lord, as your people, we choose to believe that what you declare about yourself is true and that you are trustworthy and that our feelings are not. So God, sanctify us. We trust that you will. In Jesus' name, amen.